you all welcome to the BOF. Um, hopefully we'll have a few more people joining us. Uh, just there was a little bit confusion of the time zones. Uh, I think we've run out of time for... Just pasted in the link to my friend SNG, hopefully Ray will join us, and uh, my colleagues uh, Max and Peter. Okay. I said he was going for lunch. So this is an AMA session, guys. So um, you can ask me anything. Um, I, you know, we're, we're easy here. Um, for now, just to get us started while you're thinking of questions to ask Tom, and I'll try not to lie or, uh, for the want of a better word, bullshit <laughs> So I would be a good boy. Uh, but uh, what I would, would say is um, one of the things I like about using uh, OpenBSD in my ISP is that uh, is the routing table support um, is, is quite uh, good. Um, and you can actually split all your management services out onto a management interface and effectively have a separate routing domain. Uh, so it has a completely different view of the world. It can go, it can seek updates to packages through another firewall. It, it doesn't, it's, and still be an internet router on the other side. So you can have your SSHD and your SNMPD. Um, and if you have some sort of web, you know, uh, HCBD some running, to view some statistics like, you know, like your Q stats, PF stat or something like that. You can have that all on your management interface, but then on the, when you actually do a port scan, we, even with the firewall off, when you do a port scan then of your actual production interfaces, uh, there's nothing there. It's, it's just doing OSPF, uh, BGPD or BGP or whatever. So in that case, it's quite nice. And you can do that also for like a mail server. Uh, or even your web server. So you're, you have a separate management interface uh, which you use to administer the box and then production facing, you just have it like, uh, you have it si simply just, um, uh, you have just the production services listed on the on the front end, you know? Um, and that I think is quite elegant. Uh, and it means, you know, uh, particularly on heavy systems under load. Um, and it's a technique in fairness, most networking vendors that are established have used for quite some time. So like it would be commonplace in ISPs that you wouldn't exactly pop an, an open SSH shell on the gateway interface of your, you know, of your, of your ISP router. Um, so in that case, it's, it's, it's quite good. Um, and what else would I say? Um, I lo like I've used, um, you know, in fairness, there's been some good initiatives from NLF, NLF labs in the Netherlands, uh, you know, so you got Unbound, you have uh, NSD, so they are DNS domains, uh, or DNS daemons, uh, ones for authoritative DNS, so that's your NSD, and then you also have Unbound for, let's say, your recursive, you know, like just a forward uh, for your own customer base, so it's quite nice. Um, and what's nice about the domain base in BSD is that they're, they're actually um, they're trusted and they have uh, the, the, the likes of Pledge, Privsep, and all that type of uh, other uh, mitigations put into them as well. So, um, but yeah, like um, one thing I like doing as well is running uh, it on top of a hypervisor so that you have flexibility to migrate the, so you can get high, high avail easy high availability. Or, or higher availability by just being able to move, you know, so if you to maintain a physical host, update its bias, update uh, the firmware, the CPU microcode, you can actually just move the CPU, you can migrate the VM off, do your updates, reboot, change the interfaces out, change the disks, and then just migrate back, which is, is quite nice as well. Um, I suppose, like, what? oh, Debrob has a question. Yes, I wanted to ask, can't you do that with CARP as well? Can you do that with CARP? Uh, so uh, with CARP, um, you can do it with CARP. So, yeah. you are, uh, so CARP is like common address resolution protocols like BRRP for the uninducted in the audience. 
Um, I'm not saying that anyone on this current Zoom session is not inducted, but uh, you know what I mean. So what I would say is um, uh, you can use CARP to do it, but do you have then the... So you have a box, you now need two boxes. Now you need to somehow manage the configs, which are similar, but not the same. So for instance, like with CARP, you'll have on the first box, let's say your default gateway interface is dot one. Okay, so the first CARP device might have an IP, a physical IP address of dot two, and your second CARP box will have an interface of dot three. And obviously, they then share a common virtual IP that floats between them. Uh, so uh, as you can see there, now you have a situation where the two boxes are similar, but they have different IPs. So, And for every interface that they participate in, they will have a different IP address that you have to somehow manage. Uh, and um, uh, and that, can, that can be a challenge. So sometimes, you know... That, so, yeah. that scales a lot better than... Uh a large layer two network and uh, multiple hypervisors with live migration. Yeah, like I would look at large layer two networks don't scale. Uh, like, you know, and that is, uh, I would I'd agree with that. But you, you could still like, what, I suppose what I was trying to say is that having them on a hypervisor allows for higher availability because you remove one failure mode, which is the physical hardware. But you yeah. add lots of new failure modes, the whole hypervisor stack. Yeah, but hypervisors don't fail. They do, <laughs> especially true. their networking stacks. <laughs> well, mm, I, look, actually, that's actually something I'd like to get on to, the hypervisor networking stacks. Uh, but just to, to, to answer your question, hypervisors um, are a relatively mature technology. And whichever your chosen hypervisor is, um, if it's well implemented, it should give you a, a significant degree of uptime and uh, um and sure. if you and uh, if you're carp is battle tested as well Pardon? no carp is battle tested i'm not saying that but what was sorry, what i was trying to point out was that if you have uh it running as a high look here's the thing you've got snapshots so you can make instantaneous changes and rollbacks you've got all this stuff that you have on a hypervisor that you wouldn't necessarily have on hardware. And it gives you options for recovery, uh, disaster recovery and, and backup. So I would have to insist that uh, the risk that a hypervisor introduces, particularly also if you're already, I'm not saying you'd build a hypervisor just for your open BST firewalls. No, that's ridiculous. But if you have a hypervisor infrastructure in play um, and it's running critical, mission critical loads, then why not actually use it for your open BSD or your free BSD network appliances. Um, and it's it's quite common, like we've got NFV is the buzzword or um, one the buzzword, network function virtualization. And you can get near wire speed performance with the likes of SRIOV, although the problem with that is you do lose migra uh, some migration abilities on okay. certain hypervisors with SRIOV. So um, Yep. The reasons why I wouldn't virtualize FreeBSD or OpenBSD depending on the function. So, for example, for a file server, for good throughput, I need to pass through the uh, NICs as well as the storage controllers to the guest. At that point, if I pass through the HPAs and the NICs, uh, I can no longer migrate the VM because it has it's now yeah. bound to this uh, virtual function. And for OpenBSD routers, I still found that... Uh, allowing them full access at least to affordable cheap Intel 10 gig NICs is faster than uh, the VIT.io net or other uh, hypervisor yeah. para virtualized network interfaces. And OpenBSD is normally my performance bottleneck. So the problem is how many packets per second can I push through the NIC, its driver, and the network stack. That's a really good uh, point, Jan, and I, I'd like to just expand upon that. Like, not all hypervisors and their networking stacks were created equal. Um, there's, uh, like, for instance, uh, with some of the container systems that uh, uh, one, of, one of my colleagues who was dealing with it, um, uh, one of my colleagues who was dealing with it uh, was um, 
basically what what we what we found was that with for instance um VMware VMware's network is stack uh, you can't do proper layer two bridging because the switch is not a layer two uh, proper layer two switch the V switches actually map the MAC address based on the VNX config file uh, for the interfaces and unless you purchase the enterprise enterprise plus 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 license so it's the uber uber expensive one um, then you can get the distributed V switches, which actually do function as a proper switch. And what I mean by that is it has the proper Mac learning. So it's like, oh, I've seen yes, a Mac on that interface. Uh, now you get into the uh, fun of potentially multiple times VLAN uh, stacking. Yeah. And the other problem I found is that hypervisors tend to add a lot of jitter to your system. So if I want to run an OpenBSD router, I want to have a high frequency, low core count system um, running at full speed all the time at maximum multi-core boost. Because that way I get a consistent low latency performance. Yeah, like so, so with, with some of the hypervisors, uh, yes, your core, like if you have core throttling, um, if you have KSM kernel, uh, 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 same page merging um, on KVM, uh, that can actually impact performance. Um, uh, you just, yeah, just as you answer my question, I got it. Okay, no problem. Uh, see you in a bit, Deb Trump. But uh, well, basically, one of, one of the things I would say is that uh, uh, but the other aspect of it is like so if you're if you're a hypervisor uh, if you're using it for network function virtualization then it's actually the network and stack that supports the physical interface to your virtual machine interface should be pure and shouldn't molest the traffic in any way and so what you find is that the containers uh, like uh, kubernetes and all that they actually have some natting how are you doing mo how are you doing? Mo says hi to everyone on the chat. Uh, but like so, so in that case, um, it is important that when you are selecting the hypervisor. But uh, those of you who are using VMware, it's fine for routing. But if you do any sort of layer two, um, like but if I want to build an efficient uh, VM host, I have to get a high core count system with lots of memory and I/O. And those tend to run about around two to three gigahertz instead of 4.5 to five, which limits the single thread throughput, which is important for an OpenBSD router under load because OpenBSD still doesn't make full use of SMP and high core counts in the network stack. True. No, like, like, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's uh, documented, all right. But uh, what I would say is that the flexibility, like when you're ever developing a system, you got to look at it like there's a number of things to, to consider. It's like, am I, is it going to be faster for what I do? Uh, and sometimes as a route with a router, you have to, uh, as uh, with a router, you, you, you have to size it accordingly, you know, the hardware for the task. You, you know, you, you, you need, you may need a, you don't need a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Uh, but you need a sledgehammer to break a rock. So if you're in the business of breaking a rock, you don't want a, a small, tiny and, hammer, you know? So, and uh, uh, I'm not against running OpenBSD in a hypervisor at all, but I wouldn't consider it a great complexity reduction because at some point I still have to patch the uh, virtualized OpenBSD kernel to fix a bug. And then I have to reboot it if I want to have zero downtime security updates, I still have to maintain two OpenBSD routers in a CARP and PF sync and maybe even SA sync setup. Yeah, so so I think I think yes, I think when you're when you're working on Deborah says you're not wrong, but he didn't say who's not wrong. So I'm gonna claim that one because I read it first. Uh, so uh, so Okay, I'm pulling that off, but joking. Like, no, there's no right answers here. But we'll Whatever uh, your ego requires. I look at my, my, my ego is huge, okay? So, <laughs> but like, uh, but what I would say is that like, like with the hypervisors, yes, you do have to patch them. 
But when when you have them, when you have the virtual machine load, you can move it to. The no, you have to patch device. a virtual machine inside the hypervisor. It's true, but they read times. times. That is true. Uh, that's why I didn't say. I, I if you notice, I did qualify. I said high availability. And then I went higher availability. Exactly, so, and if I uh, want to reboot the primary on-site active router during business hours and everyone drops out of their calls, uh, I get yelled at. Yeah, well, that's why- If I do a do graceful that. failover to the secondary card with stateful you see, replication. You see that, that's gray hair, right? And that's because yes. I work late at night to do these with migration windows or these, like what I would say is, but if you look at like this, if you get a server platform, it can take 10 to 15 minutes just to reboot it, okay? It can take 10 to 15 minutes to reboot it, and then it can take, uh, uh, while with a, with a virtual machine, it can be about less than a minute, you know? So there's um, So like, hardware the, suitable for routing shouldn't take that long, and it doesn't have, and the virtual machine takes the same time to reform uh, routing adjacencies. I, look, just one second. Sorry, someone's at the door here. Philip, you probably have to uh, add something to that as well. You don't uh, have to wait for us, just interrupt that, uh, me if I'm uh, too loud. Um, I don't know. It's always the same discussion by you. It's like FreeBSD is faster than OpenBSD. No, no. It's <laughs> but OpenBSD is a lot uh, easier to use and more flexible and less painful to operate as a network appliance, which is why I do run it in production. And there I like do. running it. It feels a lot nicer. Uh, for example, open BSD PF versus FreeBSD PF. FreeBSD PF may get twice as many packets per second, but it's still stuck in the bronze age while uh, IPFW is not a firewall, but a firewall construction kit. Yeah. I mean, the, the talk just from Lawrence Teo was, was just about it, like uh, use OpenBSD as long as you can, if you if you want to say it that way, uh, just uh, only in the absolute uh, niche where you need the, the maximum performance. And OpenBSD 7.0. Go for the FreeBSD part. And at least with affordable 10 gig necks and high frequency quad cores, uh, Xeons I can get six gigabits per second uh, of my traffic mix through an OpenBSD router. Yeah, I haven't looked. Of in, course, I don't in, have. I haven't looked into the latest numbers uh, from, from Moritz Buhl. He's doing uh, this uh, release know, to release or snapshot to snapshot uh, performance um, spreadsheet. Yes, but he's mostly running on uh, low power hardware. So, um, yeah, but uh, you don't get the absolute numbers, but the improvements like um, no, the, really, the, ongoing, um, the ongoing efforts in unlocking. Yes, you get some of that, but uh, if an embedded appliance has four cores and you throw eight cores at it, uh, and the four core appliance is already well loaded on all cores, additional locking may actually reduce throughput a little bit. There is an optimum uh, uh, coarseness to locking uh, for a given uh, CPU co uh, core count. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was just talking about um, 
the improvements are ongoing. And of course, um, there's always some some special use cases, and, and then you have to do the the um, performance measuring uh, work all, all yourself. So it's not that and you can just dig out and then somebody will do it for me. I consider the most valuable part of his service is that it shows when performance regresses. Yeah. Because he has a mix of different hardware limitations in the very low cache sizes, uh, crappy network drivers, and uh, very low to medium uh, core counts at reasonable medium core speed. So it's a useful mix and it's very useful to his employer because that's probably what they're deploying in production. So performance regression would be uh, noticed by the customers. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Tom, hey. <laughs> How are you? Really? Good to see you. Faces in here. <coughs> uh, it's nice to see you. Hopefully, I'll see you in Vienna. Um, yeah, sure uh, thing. I'm I'm a accepted speaker, so we will. I, I'm giving a talk about NSH. Has anyone really used NSH for OpenBSD? Um, instead of uh, you know, I didn't. So it's, it's so this uh, network shell interface. Uh, yeah, the network shell interface. So it's it's uh, read about it, but um, too familiar with the OpenBSD command line interface to it. Yeah, to yeah no, like I think like NSH is more targeted at someone who like is not familiar with BSD per se. They want to do like a router or a firewall or a load balancer, and they want to, and that that was I think what Chris Capucho's idea was. And I, f I finally worked out how to pronounce his second name. <laughs> so shout out to Chris Capucho for, in fairness, writing the, the, the software. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to slightly help, and I, uh, it's slight, but uh, get, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, I'll have a couple of people working on it as well with us. So, um, But yeah, the, the idea, I suppose, is that you'd have all the command line. all the it's, a, it's a perfect thing if you want to... Uh, make a first intrusion into a new customer and uh, network administrator is like, oh, we have only Cisco IOS or Arista or whatever, which has a very similar syntax. Exactly. Uh, and then you can say, oh, we have an uh, Arista-like, but it's OpenBSD uh, uh, underneath. Yeah. In, instead oh, of, it, it, yeah. it's more like a uh, CLI or... or, or yeah. Yeah, yes, it's a Mark. network operating system CLI, but... Uh, I never gave it a real chance. How hard is it to extend it with your own commands if you're running uh, out of features? So, yeah, so, so the, it, the way it works, it, it uses, it tries to use the, the, C, the control commands and, and wrap around them. So for instance, PF, when you edit the PF, it'll actually, it'll actually do a, a validation of the pack, uh, PF file that you've edited or the syntax. And then it'll commit it if if the syntax makes sense. Um, and same with the you know BGP, uh, BGP, DCTL, and all that BGP CTL. But, um, let's, but I'm not worried about if it will validate my pf.com. I assume it would. But what I am worried about is things like let's say uh, they lack. Uh, host uh, state uh, EF state D support, and I want to add this. How so, hard would it be to extend it? So, yeah, well, like it, it's look, it's written in C, so you actually, you know, you have to. So, and it's open source. So, I will say that I added one or two small features into it. So, for instance, uh, one of the challenges with NSH, uh, well, obviously, it had a single maintainer, which was tough on Chris Cavusha. He'd done a, a huge amount of work on it initially. Um, but as you can imagine, there's been a significant amount of development by multiple developers. Hi, Ray, how's it going? Uh, you know, on, on the various aspects of the network stack. So, for, Ray, do you want to all introduce yourselves? I, I'm terrible. I had no manners. I just kind of, we got straight into it. So, oh, so, no, no, no. Keep going, keep going. Everybody knows who I am. That's Scary Network Guy, SNG for short, also known as Ray. Hi. Uh, I overslept. Sorry. How are you doing? So we were just talking That's about what happened. we were talking about NSH and just uh, Jan asked how easy is it to extend. Like for instance, all the different um, 
let's say CCTLs or you know they like uh, for like uh, I would try to think of one, but um, I mean I can I can play the scary card like uh, it's written in C, so you cannot just throw in your mediocre Python knowledge. <laughs> you can, but the only thing I will say is it's. You can look at what they've done for previous CCTLs that they just added in. And it's, it's, it is, uh, and in fairness, Chris, uh, like when I, I put in stuff that would have broken, <laughs> broken it further, <coughs> and Chris politely said, yeah, I took your changes and uh, I made some tweaks. He basically fixed it and then put it in. So uh, it's good quality control on that. Um, and... Uh, you know, so just one sec. I was asking the course some things like the uh, horrible uh, the other interface written in Perl allow you to drop in a power file in some place and then you can define a sub command or git is extensible with new commands under a new prefix, so things like this. No, and it's not uh, like Bash completion shit as well. <laughs> yeah, bash completion with sub processes, exactly. No. <laughs> Just drop it somewhere under the exec, and yeah. as long as it follows yeah. some basic conventions, it would work. Or a new Ansible module or something like this. So, so to answer your question, Jan, about can it be extended, you still have access to the shell, you still have access to all the other OpenBSD features. So you can you can or you can work around it. But the aim is, um, the work that me and Chris have been doing over the past few months um, was to kind of bring NSH up to speed with the latest uh, development. So for instance, in the last version, he, he added WireGuard support. And so, you know, you have all the different uh, interface, uh, like I'm, I'm just thinking of the new interfaces like the uh, two port Mac Relay, um, and stuff like that. So, so we are working on it, but like there's been a hell of a lot of development on the network and stack, thanks to DLG, uh, MPI, and all Claudio and all the guys and everyone else. Sorry <laughs> if I can't think of your name, but you know there is been quite a bit. So it's to try and uh, and if you want an in network shell to be functional and usable, it needs to actually be able to uh, manipulate all aspects of the operating system. Um, <coughs> And you know, like if we're like another feature that we added in was the the, uh, the ARP reply only. Um, you know, where you have an interface that will respond to ARP requests, but it won't add in dynamic ARP entries. And this can be useful as a gatekeeper. You know, so to to that you'll only allow authorized hosts that you have a static MAC entry for. But the nice feature about that is you can put it on your firewall or gateway of a of a network, and uh, you're learning you their your individual customers who you you don't have to manage their pcs to get them online but you you actually just have to get their mac addresses and then they'd be authorized to go online as well so it's just a nice feature as well for that and it also can reduce um you know it just it reduce the complexity for full like full static arp implementations are a pain in the ass and this is kind of a nice way of where you can centrally do it, you know, and you you, you could programmatically use the DSP server to populate. So the, the um, what about the opposite? Uh, does the OpenBSD support gratuitous ARP where it just uh, broadcasts its address via ARP every few seconds uh, to uh, help with auto discovery on the network? Um, I'm not too sure. I think it like it, it does do good. I have seen gratuitous ARPs in, in packet captures. Uh, I think it does it if there's a, a IP conflict. So if someone's trying to, you know, you know, hijack it. I think it will do a gratuitous ARP if I remember correctly. Sorry, Deborah had a question, I think, or he had a yeah. stand up. I just wanted to ask, um, do you think the maintainers would be interested in adding IPFW support as well? IPF if, some, if someone were to uh, work on the code, I mean, like yeah, if so, someone submits a pull request. Okay, so pull requests. Uh, yeah, like uh, we like. I suppose at the moment it was targeted fully for OpenBSD. So you're assuming if if you wanted to port it to FreeBSD, would it be possible? Right. Um, and I suppose 
you know, I think it'll be, I think it'll be useful to have an NSH for FreeBSD because then it'll be like, uh, for the same reason that I wanted for OpenBSD as, you know, as a network admin and also for my support staff because, you know, I think uh, a lot of people who are new to Unix or Linux, um, that family, let's say, they, they find the flashing cursor intimidating and have, you know, and not having the command line uh, completion. And the NSH does have that thing where, you know, you have command line completion, you do a question mark and it tells you, well, you have these options. And then you select that option. And it goes, well, now you have these options. And, and that's quite useful, you know. Um, and uh, it's something that I suppose network engineers can take it for granted and expect of a, of a network appliance. So the answer to your question about the IPFW is, yeah, we would like to do that. Um, and uh, hi, Soph. Hi, Danny. So I'm just on a Zoom call, okay? <laughs> Do you want to say hi? <laughs> this is my son, Danny. Do you want to say hi? Hi. So these are my friends from the BSD community. This is Danny. And Sophie, do you want to say hi? Hi there. Hi. Good <laughs> job. So, um, regarding concepts not that familiar to uh, BSD, old charts like you and me, um, does anyone know of a Terraform provider for OpenBSD as a router to integrate it with the new Linux way of uh, fully automated footguns? Um, I I don't have an answer for that actually at all. Um, I have like having said that, Philip, you've done a lot of uh, uh, vagrant playbooks, haven't you? Where you just it's literally like one touch and you deploy a whole data center. That's Philip Double P. Yeah. Put you on the spot there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I didn't um, understand the question audio wise. Uh, Jan, can you repeat? Sure. Hopefully I'm understandable now. Yeah. As asking if anyone is familiar with a Terraform provider for OpenBSD routers and firewalls to integrate them with the new one true Linux way uh, of fully automated, fully automatic uh, foot guns. Can I just um, clarify? I think there was someone working on uh, OpenBSD Terraform provider, but I, I didn't follow because I'm not using Terraform right now. So we, we are staying with uh, the Packer stuff. Um, the still unfinished background, <laughs> if I ever come to it, Stupid Python binary building, and Jan, can you talk about Terraform a bit more? Like, what does it do? Is it like zero provisioning? Like, you know, literally plug in your device and then it fully deploys. Uh, think of it as a kind of continuously running uh, orchestration and deployment tool with state tracking. Basically, it knows what's the state is discovered. Uh, what's the supposed state and ways to uh, have them converge. Okay. And it's very modular. Uh, I've looked into it, but uh, it's very uh, Linux focused technology, normally combined with the likes of Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, but it's also touting that it's also modular, so it should be possible. But uh, it's a very fast moving ecosystem. So uh, Keeping a Terraform provider <coughs> rocking would be a fairly sizable commitment. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you think uh, about Ansible as a system uh, orchestration, like within the machine, within the system, Terraform is more like building the infrastructure around it. Like um, you define just how many VMs you want to have in, in that or this cloud and provider and so on. So, and what's amazing. special about Terraform is that it's stateful, as in it has its own state, it knows what state it created and how it ended up there. Um, and not just what's your current playbook and its parameters, but <laughs> it knows how many OpenBSD routers yeah, it deployed on your VM cluster. <laughs> Unless yeah. you, you lose the state file and then all hell breaks loose, just if you are running wild with it. Look, yeah, no, like it's um, 
the, the zero touch uh, type provisioning is particularly useful for like the cloud providers. Um, like the Ansible, the Vagrant stuff that Philip had worked on was pretty, uh, the Packer, as, as you call it, um, that, that probably has a fair bit of promise and can be applied. Those are different things uh, because uh, Vagrant would uh, be used to create your uh, customized installer. And then you need something to uh, run the deployment of this new customized image. Uh, is my audio uh, unacceptable? No, no, again? It's fine. no, it's fine. No, I'm just thinking. Uh, so basically, what I have uh, tested is to uh, use something like uh, Colin Percival's uh, EC2 tools, which creates a nice first run RC script to the customize FreeBSD system so that I can use the official release uh, ISO on some uh, hosting provider, then uh, have it with minimal customizations install this package, configure the system at boot, and then you uh, use this to boot install uh, Python and run Ansible uh, in pull mode. Okay, so there's a question, what, like so, like from my understanding, and Philip, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because or maybe you could. As far as I know, with Packer, it would be a full like it would run the installer, it would comply, it would configure the installer according to whatever Philip. Uh, oh, you, you, you have to see that this is building blocks, or look at it like an onion. Like Packer, you are creating the the actual image you want to run. Uh, with Vagrant, you can instantize it uh, one or multiple times on one physical machine. And with uh, Terraform, you are spreading out to multiple machines and then using your okay. um, image you have created with <coughs> over there. Okay. Um, what are the just different building blocks and attacking the, Think the of same like story this. from you... different angles? Okay. So you have a running deployment. Uh, with two OpenBSD 7.0 routers. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you, you would use Packer to build your customized 7.1. Yeah. And you would use something like Terraform to handle the migration, <coughs> uh, creating new uh, VMs, waiting until they have booted and installed. Uh, then stopping them, maybe reconfiguring them, tagging them taking one of the old VMs down, bringing up one of the new VMs as its replacement in CARP, and so on. Okay. But uh, you're creating an ever more complex deployment with ever more automation, which is great at scale, but it also means that you can uh, create a large explosion with one button press. Okay, uh, like, like with NSH, it's more like an individual configuration system. Um, it is really just to allow you to, and it is focused on the network and stack. So it is for controlling network daemons, like uh, the load balancer relay D, um, the web interface, uh, the you know the packet filter interface. IPFW, uh, Dan, I'll have a chat with uh, Chris of what will be involved in plumbing that, um, like, uh, and see, like, I think we probably, probably, if we wanted to do that for all the BSDs, and it, it might make sense, is to have it that it's, there's a layer between, like, at the moment, it's all, let's say, for, you know, it's kernel uh, IOCTLs or, and SysCTLs that we're using to control it. Uh, to control the OpenBC kernel. So uh, we may need a layer to, like a translation layer or shim that you can kind of go, right, you want to do this, you have to do this for FreeBSD or Dragonfly and for OpenBSD, you do something else. So yeah. um, at the moment, the focus is on OpenBSD um, and like, you know, uh, but, but uh, I certainly, I could have a chat with Chris to see what will be involved because uh, I suppose the more users we would have of it as a, as a shell, uh, the better chance of success, you know, and I, I, like we'd like more interest in the shell itself. 
and to make people's lives a little bit easier, I suppose, would be uh, the aim, uh, you know, and that's that's why I kind of got involved in it. Um, uh, and uh, like a, like a, my company um, is trying to uh, put resources into developing it a little bit more as well. Um, fully open sourced. Um, we're not like, it's not like we're creating secret sauce and keeping it for ourselves. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. Um uh, but you know, it, it is very much led by Chris. So, like uh, when we were putting in, like with changes, um, he's he's um, he, he's at least uh, providing that quality <laughs> quality assurance and checking on it. Um, one of the cool things was it was just interesting in it was when we were doing the manuals. I started using aspects of it, uh, the NSH and OpenBC that I don't really touch myself in daily life. And so you kind of got you get to find little bugs and stuff like that. Um, so we're trying to work on how we could do some CI testing. Um, uh, and I probably need to talk to Theo B for that, and just because obviously they do uh, quite a lot of uh, continuous integration and testing. And I think Jan, you were talking about how they test the performance of it, but uh, I probably. And um, Philip mentioned that. Uh, that Moritz Buhl is running uh, um, automated uh, performance measuring and yeah. has the uh, historical data uh, available online. Yeah. So that uh, you can trace uh, each so benchmark Morris, on yeah. each box over time and see trends that, oh, between these, in this uh, quarter, suddenly we our throughput dropped by 20%. Yeah, we have to uh, fix this before the next release. That I think was some CPU mitigations that had a, an impact. Yeah, uh, you and know, so the other uh, thing, in case I confused anyone with my questions uh, regarding Terraform, while those do dig uh, as deep as MSH into the uh, OpenBSD system, they are for totally different use cases. So a Terraform provider is no replacement for NSH. They solve completely different problems. One is for yeah. interactive, easy use by someone familiar with classical network uh, command, uh, appliance command line interfaces. And the mm -hmm. other is for, uh, yeah, more than system yeah. administration styles. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And thanks for the clarification. But uh, yeah, so, so for for us, it's it's about just trying to add in as many of the features as possible, um, and, and you know, and not break stuff. Uh, you know, that helps as well. Um, and it's also things like you know, it's it's creating a command line and having it identified. Uh, it can be difficult as well. Like I think we you, you we have all seen some in shell interfaces where you know you run the command and you're not too sure if it work the first time, but if you run it the second time, it actually does something completely different. Um, you know, where, where you're saying, oh, remove the first root in the table. And you're like, well, okay, but if you run that twice, you're actually removing the first and second. Um, but you, you, but you're, you know, so there's those types of uh, questions. Um, but yeah, so that's something that we're working on at the moment and even just in documentation. Um, but the IPFW, I'll certainly follow up on that. Has anyone else any questions or any feedback or or do you want to add anything in, I suppose? Any questions about networking in general? You got Ray, Philip, Dan there as well. Me. I'm going to keep talking. Um, I will do it. What I will be bringing up uh, in Vienna is uh, Jitsi on OpenBSD. And that will, will be a distributed setup. So each of the components will be in its own VM. And then you need uh, all the, the cross network and stuff. So that might be quite interesting as well. That's cool. And and in what way are you planning on doing the cross networking or um like like are you are you tunnel is it like for within the same data center? So it's just IP routing or are you doing tunneling as well? Yeah, it's, ju it's just a necessary PF rule, so um, it's easily to adapt. So there will be no special magic or whatever. So if need be, see, uh, for example, for performance reasons or whatever, you need uh, 
the video bridge or the recording stuff which needs, an, for example, a headless uh, Chrome running and all this shit. So if you need that one on, on, uh, on a Linux machine, you can still do that, but understand the complete setup. Uh, so it's more chitsy than a BSD talk. <laughs> okay. But I will, uh, will provide a package. So you can have a vm.com for a background file. Uh, which will set up all the necessary VMs. And then you can replace them with a full physical machine with either OpenBSD or maybe a Linux machine because you need this super crappy uh, stack for the, the recording of sessions. Okay. And, uh, and, what, do, and uh, what, pe what do people think of WireGuard or what's your favorite VPN provider on BSDs in general? Uh, or have you a preference? I very much look forward to when WireGuard gets a client in, like a in, what is it called? It like shipped with the the OS, for example, on on macOS and Windows, so that you can just send a profile to someone and it does everything for them. <coughs> That's yeah. what I need. That's the final thing I, I need before I I can switch away completely from my PSEC. That's the only thing I need. I look forward to when that happens because I'm um, it. There is a WireGuard client for macOS. It's a user space no, uh, no. only client. I, I'm talking yeah. about. And it, I'm talking about you being can, able. To, um, yeah, stop, please stop. I'm talking about a being able to send just a profile, just like a profile with a username and password and the connection. Yeah, identification. Uh, you can share and a configuration file. I, I know, but they don't have to install the client first. It, it, needs, oh, to be, uh, it needs to be that the client is included in the OS from so, Apple, from Microsoft. So, oh, it, so you're dreaming of a, um, a feature addition to the mobile profile system, so I that don't, you don't need no, a complete I MVM solution. I, I just, I just want how I just want how it's done with an IPsec because with IPsec you can just send the profile yeah. and nothing else. So in other words, you don't have to install new software. It's in Daniel does that. You, so you could just say to the customer, look, you have it. It's on your system already. It's built in. Here's the settings you need. And boom, you're on our network. Uh, and I, I, I do. I, it's kind of, you know, you can hear collective groans when, you know, you say, well, look, if you want to use our service, you just need to install this client. And you just go, oh. and then they go, oh, well, our team have to agree to that. We... What are the risks? What will it do to the rest of the network and stack? Blah, blah. Well, and, well you can uh, use IPsec, for example, with L2TP uh, plus IPsec uh, that way and have your users uh, point uh, and click where your screenshots tell them to. Um, that's very error prone. The better solution is to uh, provide them with a mobile profile file, which is a plist file with all the settings and then they can just import that if you yeah. have the right kind of trust relationship with them i'm talking uh, about on, on multiple oss though I, i'm also talking about windows i'm talking oh, for all in the people that case that I, for all for all of the people that i have a vpn hosting for i need uh, to okay. give them a profile <laughs> because Hang on a second okay that's if a different use case if you think about it, how long it took Microsoft uh, and also Apple to, into, uh, to include IPsec. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was doing the IPsec um, for HAL 2001, which was <laughs> 2001. <laughs> so that's I mean, it's years. probably going to take a while, yes. Yeah, but so, so ma watching. make it 10 years uh, before we can talk about that. Exactly. Uh, on a side-to-side -side level, uh, I'm let's say happy enough that I can finally plan to migrate to Ike version two instead of version one, because it's getting, uh, uh, let's say illegal <laughs> for, for not so proper term, but to, to have the point. Uh, so WireGuard is even more out of, uh, out of the question for me for side to side stuff uh, to other providers or anything like that. So switching to, like we too is already the step and why I got this way out. Well, okay. Uh, how you doing, Michael? Good to Good see you again. Yourselves. Hey, hello, hey. hello, hello, Philip, Tom. Good to see you all. Hey. And uh, like, you know, like I think, uh, like 
I think wire guards, it's a, it's quite an interesting approach, like, you know, where you don't have the states and you just... I, you know, I have been playing with it in 2017 or something <coughs> in Hack for Clarus, the, the, the first uh, implementations way before there was any OpenBSD implementation. And, we, and I have been looking into the very initial code and it was like completely Linuxism. So just porting something, no way. And uh, we can be really glad that uh, something like two, three years ago, someone really sat down and made a clean room implementation and did not try to port it. Yeah. Because that so, would have been at least two or three Amok uh, runs. Uh, <laughs> of yeah. But to be fair, uh, like Jason Donafi, like he seemed to like you know try his bet, you know do a fair bit of work on it. But what was interesting as well was that the OpenBSD implementation. A bit of trivia. Uh, I don't know if any of you use VPP vector packet processing, but uh, it's not. That's a, it's you know it's FD.io is the website, but. It was a code that was donated to um, the world or the community by Cisco. So Cisco's content switching gateways for years ago would have run VPP. And the short version of the story is that it rather than have an interrupts uh, and packet routing with interrupts on interfaces, you have a polar. And you literally go to the interface, what do you have for me? And you, you you take a big shovel full of packets and then move them as opposed to just going, oh, I have a packet. Oh, and the CPU stops what it's doing. Gets the, and so you have a load of cache misses. And and obviously, then I'm making um, use of Intel's cache um, director. The, the real difference isn't the uh, batching because any good one gigabit card should support interrupt. Uh, rate, uh, control, but uh, the important part is that VPP handles each uh, processing step for the whole batch to improve uh, cache hit rates. Yeah. So basically, it would perform all the layer two functions for all packages in a batch, then the layer three, then the next, and so on, to get uh, a warm eye cache because the network stack does not fit into the instruction cache of a single uh, hyperthread. And the VPP is not in the CCIE. You're dead right, Mo. It's not. Um, I, I, and uh, it, but one thing I will say is it's it is quite a fast. But interestingly enough, the so they use graph processing. Uh, it, it it's probably a bit much for this talk anyway. But just it's it's an interesting one where if you need to do very very fast routing, faster than let's say your kernel forwarding ones. It's an interesting, uh, uh, and effectively what you do is you run an application, it talks directly to the NIC, and it can either do routing, it can do bridging, it can do, uh, it can actually be also a wire guard or an IPSEC gateway. But with IPSEC, they, you know, they say that they can do with one, a single core 20 gigs of throughput on it. So it's, it's, they're the type of figures. It's shortcutting, it's horrible, it does avoid, like there's, you know, it's literally like packets on the wire into cash. And, uh, you know, you pray and you hope everything's going to be awesome. But like, it's, you know, it, it, there is some kind of inherently scary about uh, taking packets off the wire and just lashing them into your CPU cache without any checks. Well, I'm sure there is some checks, but... Well, you know. not really, because that's where we'll, where we'll... We have to end up in your last level cache anyway. So starting with, I think, Sandy Bridge, Intel added the feature you mentioned, the uh, direct AO into the last level package cache. But it has been disabled in a lot of places again because uh, it uh, just crashes the cache in most use cases. Yeah, so, so but the, one of the interesting things is that they took the WireGuard implementation from OpenBSD and they actually implemented a VPP WireGuard gateway effectively for VPP, but they actually use the OpenBSD's uh, implementation of WireGuard um, uh, for, to do that, which is, you know, it's just an interesting kind of an aside. Um, uh, but it was just, it was just something, it, it is something worth looking at where, you know, if you need something a little bit faster than what your current chosen yeah. network operating system in its kernel can do. Um, but it, you know, it, I wouldn't say it's a replacement for it, like it's, you know, but it's, 
it, it is a tool there that has a niche that that um, particularly in the like very fast forwarding. Um, uh, yeah, well, what, but what Wirecard really was really showing us is uh, you have to to put out a, a really good spec in the first place and not come up with. Uh, some crappy implementation and doing something here and something there, and then it blows up in your face. That's the Cisco way. Um, but having really like a, a good definition of a protocol which can be re-implemented. I mean, he was running around like, oh, you should uh, implement this a bit different or a bit uh, the other way. But in the end, you can just re-implement it uh, by all your own means without relying on magic soup word salads or number arrays uh, where no one knows what it's actually doing. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a, a key driver of the WireGuard success. Yeah, so WireGuard is just an example of good minimal protocol design. Yes. Any yeah, yeah. Handshake is I don't talk. <laughs> if you have to write it down uh, all your own, you, you start not to make it too complicated. It's not product uh, management and marketing, but you have to lay out all the, the bitsy technical specs uh, all on yourself. So you are keeping it short. Or so compare the IQV1 and IQV2 uh, RFCs. IQV1 is a clusterfuck beyond imagination designed by a committee of uh, uh, cryptographers and uh, university professors and everyone had to get his name on the paper. Yeah. And so everyone added a feature and every ego needed to be placated to get a consensus. So it's a, just because uh, there were fewer players involved, IQV2 is a better protocol than IQV1. And the other thing is the designer of WireGuard uh, comes from an offensive security background. Yeah. He wants to design protocols which are resilient to active attacks and uh, which don't announce themselves on the network unless they have to. Yeah, so there... And Big stealth, uh, so that they effectively you could have a it, the original design, which is mad, like is that you could have a piece of malware, let's say, on a network, and it needs to dial back to the command and control center. You don't want something like an SSTP tunnel, for argument's sake, where it just keep alive every 10 seconds. So, you know, it's like a red flag on a firewall could easily spot it. So it's something that could literally wake up, send a message out to the control you know, server, the, uh, and one of the interesting state an hour later. You know, it'd be one of the up. interesting design choices of WireGuard is that unless you know the key, the peer, unless you have provided with valid peer, uh, public keys and a shared key, the uh, the opposite peer is not supposed to provide any answer, uh, any reply, neither positive nor negative. So. You can't scan for uh, one unless it tries to connect or has keep alive uh, configured. But you can have a WireGuard listener configured, and will, it will only respond to uh, the uh, authentication. Yeah. So Daniel did ask me. He was saying, "Isn't that like a Linuxism, a Linuxy thing?" Uh, well, it's run by the Linux Foundation, I think the, the VPP now. Um, but in ways, it's. It sits on top of Linux, but it's an application that talks directly to the network card. So it's kind of, it's 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 different. So, but it was a network, this is a networking buff. So uh, I'm using a bit of poetic license, but yeah, it, it, like it is, uh, it is run by the, um, uh, the Linux Foundation, that uh, VPP project. Um, it is an interesting, uh, I would love to see I'd love to see if there was a way of doing this. Uh, like, it's really fast, um, and so it ticks that box. But all the security kind of concerns that you might have with running software mitigations and stuff like that, you, you, um, I'm not casting any aspersions on it, but it, 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 it takes a wildly different approach to, let's say, either FreeBSD or or, or, or Linux or well, OpenBSD to, you know, their, like, because they use kernel forwarding. So, so there has been a report attempted to NetMap. Yeah. But, but I don't think it made it very far. 
and uh, the port attempt for NetMap. I, I believe NetMap was in FreeBSD already, was it not? Or are you saying NetMap, it was for somewhere? Yes, else? NetMap is a FreeBSD specific API to basically. No, it's not. It's in Linux as well. PPP needs from the operating uh, system. It's a way to uh, intercept frames as they arrive or depart for ring buffers. Okay. Albert says he's got to go and get some food. Albert, enjoy your food. Um, let us know if it's nice. Come back and give us, <laughs> tell us how you get on with your food. Um, and uh, but uh, it's a good no. There's a good question uh, about the 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 what, is it a Linux system? And it is strange, I have to say. And the syntax, um, PPP syntax, is quite different to anything you would have ever experienced with OpenBSD, Linux or FreeBSD, or any of the BSDs? Uh, as far as I know, VPP is very much its own thing, and a foreign uh, invader from the kernel's point of view, on Linux yeah. as well as on any other operating system you would port it to. It's yeah, basically it its it... own user space networking stack optimized for forwarding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, send, and I'm not going... I'm going to add input and output on that as well. Like I saying, you know, for proxying or tunneling or, you know, encapsulation, de-encapsulation. So there's a, the, the one thing I would say is yeah. that the way VPP would work, and maybe people who know NetMap in, in FreeBSD can add to this conversation. So the way VPP would work is it actually binds directly to the PCI um, device itself. And actually, the and then... The, the program skips skips the entire the effectively that network device is then no longer even seen by the kernel it's it's gone uh, by the Linux kernel let's say um, and uh, so it's, it's it's wildly different in concept to let's say your standard typical meat and potatoes routing or bridging in through the kernel in Linux FreeBSD or OpenBSD or any of the other BSDs uh, sorry yeah. to drag it fly in net. But so, like, you know, NetMap, so, like, yeah. so NetMap is very similar to the Intel way of doing it, but uh, not hardware specific. So the acceleration framework to access Intel NICs used by VPP uh, is um, Intel specific and only really fast on, uh, on Linux systems. I think this toolkit has been ported to FreeBSD as well, but uh, not fully because its implementation contains a lot of Linux systems as well. But yeah. NetMap is a driver agnostic way. If a driver is NetMap capable, well, basically each uh, ring buffer the, uh, the NIC contains, it will be accessible via NetMap. And then you have a single producer, single consumer ring buffer per NIC queue and can intercept the packets. You, and you don't have to forward them to the kernel. You can, so if you enable NetMap, you can still use the network interface at reduced performance, but you don't have to. Okay. Whereas, um, so it doesn't completely disappear, but it depends then on your NetMap application to uh, write back the, at least the, to re queue the packet into the ring buffer. Uh, in the upstream direction. I guess so. there's also a net graph on FreeBSD from the two point oh days, which oh, is very. Uh, net graph is something completely different. I know, but like VPP is, is based on on graph graphing, yeah. if I recall correctly, and that's what uh, net there graph was something else which is also available. Uh, some kind of uh, V switch or something it's called that just has been ported to FullBSD at least, and it may have been ported to uh, um, OpenBSD as well. But so, net, you think so, hmm? so NetGraph, can you, um, Daniel, can no, you tell I'm us sorry, more I, about it? It's, uh, I don't understand it well enough to actually use it. I just know it's um, in FreeBSD, and I know it gets used for Bluetooth, and I know it gets used uh, for prototyping network, networking, basically. So, there's I've also, used it enough yeah. and written a user space network node in C so I can say a little bit about it. 
if someone wants to know. So Michael Dexter is asking if anyone's look for some support work. I know someone who needs mostly troubleshooting and CDR call data rec uh, records, um, readability issues. The VoIP server is Isabel, I think, and which I found to be a kind of a fork of elastic before it got buried by 3CX. Um, thanks to Michael. So if anyone's interested in that, contact Michael Dexter. Um, I, I think that's like winning Super Millions lottery or whatever, getting that combination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear because it's above my pay grade. The, the CDRs are like, uh, yeah, they're, and uh, usually it's kind of like money, like, you know what I mean? Like if you're on a VoIP provider, it's like ching, ching. So it's like, if you make mis make a mistake, that's a lot of ching that can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so. it can uh, be even worse if you're out of compliance with some kind of uh, lawful intercept. Well, luckily in the EU, that's all been struck down by the German uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, uh, but you still, at least in the US, you still have to provide certain interfaces uh, to extract metadata and maybe even data at the court's uh, decision. And the same is true in the EU as well. So. A court order can force a provider to provide one of these supported interfaces. And if you mess up and don't uh, produce the data because your deployment is broken, courts tend to frown upon that and uh, <coughs> will fi find uh, you <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, in yeah. contempt. Yeah, no, I think, uh, oh, wait, oh, oh, it's, it's open source. Isabel, Isabel is okay. open source. That's a pleasant surprise. Okay, I didn't know hmm. that. I'm just Me having a look. Hmm. Philip right. had a different topic in the chat. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading about a lot of uh, diffs that I have been fl flying through tech at about the 240 uh, slash 4 um, prefix, um, which was uh, reserved for experimental years. whatever shit around and um, so now OpenBC would allow it in, in principle but I have been reading on, on Twitter and all that that uh, there's so much stuff out there that uh, opera having an assignment in 240-4 will be really 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 painful and uh, like I've go seen I've seen a claim that at least some silicon vendors decided to design the T camps in a way that you can't uh, allocate T camp space for this range, so it would all end up in the slow path. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, but without any uh, source behind it, just a wild claim. Yeah, because like, look, here's the thing: it's a thirty-two. Like, uh, well, I'd have to. Well, it's the last, okay. Like, would it really save any space on the TCAM to lop off the 240? No, uh, supposedly uh, it's a multi-bank solution and uh, the bank isn't implemented in silicon. <coughs> so basically you have multiple TCAM banks in parallel and some of it isn't just isn't implemented. It, I, that's all I have. I'd have to look, like, I think, if being honest, the 240, like it was, uh, its definition was reserved for future use, if I remember, experimental and reserved for future use. Yes. Um, and if you're building an IP I mean, device. I mean, what I think that's really interesting is there's so much uh, reserved and whatever special use cases stuff. But uh, especially this prefix is so baked in, in in do not forward and do not accept and do not whatever. So if you are just going <laughs> and, and have your own little local network and you, for whatever reason, start to assign uh, 240 uh, addresses, so it will just uh, freak out and do not work. And that's just for this prefix, it's uh, especially bad. Yeah, 
But I think what will happen is they'll implement a standard and say, look, we need to do the 240. We need to give IPv4 another 40 years of lifetime. Uh, and, uh, no, no, I mean, uh, you, you can uh, look that uh, up in 20 year old code. I mean, I should have uh, some iOS uh, source code from 11.2 or 11.3. There's probably already rules in there. Oh no, and like, look, it's a standard rule that we would deploy. Like if you, if any of you have ever implemented what the formerly the NSA hardening guides for Linux. No, no, wait, 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 wait. We are not talking about uh, any broken list or whatever. List. whatever. It's really baked into the network stack itself, like a hidden root null table, a hidden one. It's yes. not about policies Definitely. and configuration. It's in the stack. <laughs> But look, if we change it now in 20 years' time, 240 will become useful. That, that's exactly what Theo was saying about 64-bit t uh, time t or something like that. And that's uh, the same for, for especially the WireGuard question uh, about when will that be uh, common sense. But the 240 slash 4 uh, unicast proposal was more like, we need address space right now, right now. Please give us something. But OK. Give it it a time, but it was more like we need address Excuse space me for a right second, now, folks. Right now, please uh, give us something. But, the bar, okay, the bar, 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 the the bar, the 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 Yes, Dan? Um, basically, what will happen is the buff will start, stop streaming, and I'll start it streaming on another section. OK, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Take care, everyone. Don't go. Don't. Ah, fuck. Why would he do that to us? He just, I wanted to we were saying, sorry, you're all allowed to go if you want. Uh, but no, I, I think the 240, look, here's the thing. I asked the question a few years ago, just because some people have it baked in, that's a bad implementation. And they'll get washed out after a few years. Like, you know, planned obsolescence, all that kind of crack. The, it's like a, an, an example of where you can have that 240 problem is Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1, sorry, 1.1.1.0 slash 24 is, um, it, you know, it's hardly, they found it really difficult that once they announced it, there was just a huge amount of traffic coming into it because a lot of people had set off the Cisco examples, you know, one to one to one to one. So there was all this arbitrary traffic where badly configured routers were pinging one to one to one or whatever, or they were trying to connect to it like with a VPN or, or something. That's, and so it was actually a massive. Yeah, that's a. Uh... Almost as bad as when IANA came up with, uh, oh, let's do a DNS a resource record on example.com. <laughs> and all the hidden emails uh, living in some, some queues uh, suddenly uh, became uh, <laughs> trying to deliver to there. There was, there was no um, listening MTA, but all, all of the test systems suddenly tried because there was an A record. And 20 years ago, they promised, they promise, no, no, we will never put it on DNS. And there it is. And it's only there to have a website saying, this is for educational purposes only. You cannot believe the shit. Uh, it's almost as good an idea as uh, allowing a .corp TLD. Yeah. <coughs> because, yeah. of course, some uh, Windows uh, active... Domain system will be there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or contoso.com. Yeah. So, any other questions, folks? So, no the problem I see with uh, unleashing 240. Uh, slash 4 on the internet is that someone poor uh, soft will uh, get stuck with one of those addresses. And suddenly everyone else has to care about them or um, tell them uh, to, uh, yeah, go away. To retire IKE V1. So Philip wants to retire IKE V1, but it works, kind of, doesn't it? 
Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you start to, to have to replace uh, key lengths and the other side suddenly doesn't go on with the proposal any longer and it sends yeah. like 15 proposals and whatnot. It's, it's pain in the ass. Um, That's true. And the other problem is that Ike V1 is so complex to implement, takes so many round trips and so on. And everything you want is an extension, uh, which may not uni be universally implemented. Then there are tons of extension nobody really wants, but you still have to implement um, for interoperability. And the other problem is that, um, yeah, it's just too many mandatory, no longer acceptable features are required in the RFCs. The original ciphers, I think, are all broken in and do not use. So you have no hash algorithm you, uh, left over you want to use from the mandatory implemented set, stuff like this. Uh, the other problem is also that IQV1 is just uh, very noisy on the network. So it's a horrible protocol. We should just uh, take the uh, <coughs> key exchange from WireGuard and call it IQV3. Mo, Mo is going to head off. Mo, thanks for coming and joining. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I'll see you around. Hopefully, come to Vienna or BSD can next year. Dan and I are going to open up a new bar called the New Royal Oak. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, that's right, Tom. No pressure. <laughs> so I'm uh, very sorry to hear of uh, the Royal Oak. Uh, many a network discussion has been had in that, and I hope they can. Uh, I hope they come back. I, I hope there's some sort of restart fund for businesses in Canada after you know, because obviously the closures for you know for health on health grounds were you know warranted, and uh, now at least when. With the, hopefully they get the support to, to reopen anyway, but in time for us to come back and for the locals. But uh, so uh, it, it was a very convenient uh, watering hole for all of us to visit uh, when we were there. So I'm actually very sorry to. And uh, the guys were really cool. You know the guys behind the bar, just really friendly, really helpful. Um, the bar did close too early. That's something that, uh, Daniel, you need to, can you change the licensing laws by the time next year comes around? I'm on it. Come on. <laughs> he, it's not as if he has enough work to do, you know, we just, but you know, if you, if you want something done, you got to give it to a busy person. There you go, Dan. No good deed goes unpunished. But no, like, like, uh, <clears throat> is there, like, is there any features that you'd like to see or that developments in OpenBSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, Dragonfly that you like, that you, you're looking forward to, that you're, that you, you know, that you want to discuss while we're all here? Document NetGraph, okay. That's Michael Dexter saying that, by the way, not me. Ah, <laughs> just I put words in your mouth really successfully. Like, Why didn't you just come out with that straight out? Like, I got to hang you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no one really needs that. <clears throat> BPF, does anyone use the Berkeley packet filter? What do you use it for? I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. I'm a Viking. Okay, one second. Do you want to say hi? Oh. <laughs> okay, go on. Talk to you in a minute. I don't know where it is. So. Right, talk to you in a bit. Goodbye. Later.
hopefully someday I'm going to get him into, you know, use child labor, getting programming, working for me. So, and his older sister as well. So I'm working on him slowly. It's like, hey, do you want to come to, with daddy into the office on Saturday? They're like, no, we just want to play in the Nintendo. But I'll work on it. Just it takes time. You got to start him young, you know. That's it. So, uh, Ray, have you any questions or have you any cool projects that you've done recently on BSD that you want to share? I'm being unfair because he might be away. Or Katie, would you like to ask any questions or talk about what you do with BSD? I'm good, but thank you. Are you sure? Okay, that's good to hear. Good to, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, and uh, LN, LSN, whoever that is. Well, I think we're going to have to uh, put a pin in the buff if, if no one's going to talk. Philip, do you want to talk? Do you want to ask questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> people are running away right now. Um, we've been talking about uh, BPF. Uh, not, uh, I was not thinking about eBPF like in, in Linux is going on a lot, and I do not know how much it is in in uh, in FreeBSD. Um, but um, I have seen the the part about um, logging in uh, Lawrence Teo talk. Uh, about his uh, yeah, well, threat intelligence stuff. I was just thinking about it in combination with uh, uh, ISA KMPD uh, and Ike V1. Uh, we are logging in OpenBSD to uh, a PCAP file there. So you can TCP dump on the log okay. file, which is very efficient and very fast. Yeah. And it's only the nasty part about that is uh, if you are not really documenting the, the PCAP format, it's not that flexible as you, you think you could have it. For example, uh, I would get that up here in a second. Cool. Do you want to share your screen? No, 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 it's, it's just one line or more or less just to, to say, uh, to see the problem. So uh, in ISA KMPD, you can log file in the PCAP file and to to read it um, and to filter it, you need stuff like this. <laughs> okay. And that's like really mad because you have to do these uh, offsets like uh, the 26 byte in the UDP packet has to match uh, the value of two and, and also on. So you cannot have a descriptive language unless you teach TCP dump in code especially. So that would be cool if we could just have uh, those definitions. Like if you do TCP dump and you say, please host uh, 1234 and port 22. And here I could say, because that's what it is doing is uh, please this host and uh, ignore uh, are you there packets, which you have in oh, cool. like, uh, this is I the what they're doing. So to have a textual filtering, <coughs> uh, but without altering the TCP dump source, because not everybody wants to, to recompile TCP dump just to have a special filter or something like that. So that, that would be something nice uh, we, we could hack on when it comes to uh, log filing um, network protocol demons. I get you. So you're, so you're logging and then you saw it. Effectively, you're trying to create your own filter to intelligently parse the, the actual header of, let's say, the IPsec header. You're actually, you're let's say, you're not just going at the IP. You're actually looking at the. No, no, wait. The, this is not the wire protocol. It's the the log file protocol. The ISA okay. KMB daemon is writing his log file in PCAP format. I but get the you. general idea is to give TCP term something like look up byte rules and give this textual representation so you can write your filter rules in, in plain English. I get you. Okay. And then, and then, okay. And then you can use, let's say, if you have a graphical tool like uh, 
Wireshark or something like that. You can yeah, exactly. You can you could yeah. view you could do your filtering through that interface. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that's cool. That's a it's an interesting way of there would be an interesting solution there. Yeah, I don't know um, how many uh, demons in OpenBSD would actually uh, really. Uh, could make use of this this kind of debugging like i um, i don't know if for example P pgpd is really doing so much logging that it would be nice performance wise uh, to uh, to write down that in in a pcap form at all if this was just like because we can do it i don't know well like in bgpd they have like the full i think it's the it's, oh i better do um, hold up I'm just doing it before I say it. MRT. So they have MRT support. Uh, so you can dump out like the, the BGP table and stuff like that. Uh, and Claudio was recently doing a bit of work on that or a lot of work, but uh, he he was refining that. Uh, but like with the BGPD, you, like particularly at the internet level and if you want from a security point of view to see if People are hijacking or attempting to hijack your network traffic. Um, yeah. You, you, need, you know, the, the logging features are well. They're also useful for like those and kind of edge cases or corner cases that didn't yeah, work. Yeah. So, out. so the, the the point being here is um, also for unknown network uh, wire protocols. It would be the part like okay, I have a filtering rule like this one, only with uh, byte offsets and and values. Uh, but I want to have a plain English filtering language without altering TCP dump sources. Uh, because right now, if there are new fields in BGP, for example, uh, then you cannot use TCP dump and just say, and new field must be one or something like that. That doesn't work. You have to go this way. I mean, luckily enough, we can do that. But it would be nice if I could just have something like an ETC magic file, but then I have an ETC PCAP file. Where I can put in UDP twenty six is zero two equals a DPD packet. Yeah, I can say I filter this for DPD packets. Oh yes, sir. Well, that's cool. That will be an idea for in the next five years, <laughs> wherever. Oh, that's cool. Like, like, like. I think uh, like being able to parse logs or or edit the edit the way you view them and and render them is really uh, it's a really powerful like it's a it's a powerful kind of skill to have you know yeah. to be particularly when you're dealing with large volumes of data um, being able to actually just cut through it all and just say this is what I want this is the um, I want. And how do you handle all the data that that generates? So does that generate a lot of data per day? Like, or and uh, do you do batch processing to kind of take the data like you need and put store it in a? It's, it's not that it's not that much. The, the only hack over here was uh, that's a bit difficult for Isaac KMPD in, in particular is. Um, the log file rotation is is a bit of a uh, bit of a mess. Like uh, you have to um, <coughs> you have to to stop the logging for um, yeah, well, a millisecond or something like that. Uh, wait. I have to do something like this. So this is the, the PCAP, uh, PCAP logging off, and then you yep. put it back on uh, with, a, with a time uh, day in the, in the month. And so I can use the PCAP files once, once per day, which doesn't really work if you have to restart the daemon and all this shit. But so I keep the, the volume per file down to maybe a hundred megabytes or so, and that's that's easy handling. Okay, yeah, gotcha. So the, if if that uh, approach would be useful, is more like um, are the protocols evolving that fast that uh, 
baked in support in TCP dump is taking too long to, to catch up? That would be the question if it's useful to, to make such an extension to TCP dump. Oh, yeah, sure. And so, Philip, uh, are you going for long in Vienna or how long will you be there? Oh, uh, I will probably fly in Wednesday or Thursday, something like that. Uh, I won't do a, a tutorial and I won't attend. Uh, no more pub crawling for me, so I don't know. And it depends on the workload anyway. So Wednesday or Thursday, I will have to decide. I'm planning on going early, trying to meet up a few people and uh, shoot the breeze for a bit. So. So I'm hoping to go. Danny, are you coming to Europe? You might hear me be on another stream there. All right, well, if no one else has any questions, we'll put a cork in this one. Um, all right, lads. Uh, Philip, thanks for joining, and Katie, LN, LSN, thank you very much for joining, and I uh, hope you got something out of it. Uh, I really enjoyed it anyway. It was good to see my friends, Philip, Dan, Ray, when he was there. I uh, really appreciate it. All the best, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.